today, we've been in a series uh, called Go Share, right? And uh, we heard Charles preach the first Sunday of that. Last week, uh, we had a missionary with us. Did you enjoy our missionary guest last week? Mm. The stories she told were just heart-wrenching, weren't they? Of what God is doing on that mission field. And again, we can't talk about it because we're now live streaming, but uh, we, can, we can definitely declare that, uh, you know, we had a fantastic week yesterday, uh, and not yesterday, last week uh, here. And so we're really excited. Today, um, today I really have the privilege of inviting a guest back that uh, those of you been around a while, you know, uh, because this gentleman by the name of Cap Marks, who's coming to share today, uh, was the interim pastor filling in while this church was in transition before Teresa and I came on staff here as our pastors. And uh, it just, it's such a privilege. I've known Cap for years and years and years and years and, and years. No, I'm kidding, he's not that old. But I do remember him as a kid, actually, to be honest with you, uh, in the district and being involved in things. And so uh, I've known and watched this man for so many years and just am so thankful for his consistent and steady ministry through the years, both in churches as well as in our district office, as well as now out of that in retirement, he fills in uh, for churches in between in transition, as well as filling in gaps in speaking when churches need them to come in. And so I asked him uh, a while back if he would come and share as a part of our series on the Go Share. And uh, he so graciously said yes. And we're so thankful to have Cat back. Will you welcome him back today to the platform? Oh, come on. Welcome him back up here. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. It's good to be back. It's good to be anywhere this age, right? After Especially all those after, years and years and years and those years. years and years, yeah. And I remembered your parents before I remember you. <laughs> um, and they are, there's a lot of years and years. They're there. old. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I didn't say that. But our granddaughter, when she was about nine years old, she would remind Grandma, you're old, Grandma. And Grandma said, well, you are too. She said, uh-uh. Grandma says, you're nine years old. And I think that convinced her. And then one of them, one of the granddaughters, when she was small, she found in, the yard, in a yard sale a sign said, caution, old people's crossing. And she bought that and put it at our driveway. And so... I think we have to admit, yeah, but it's okay. Well, it's good to be with you today, and old friends, old friends, uh, longtime friends, and uh, we have fond memories of our weeks, our few months that we were with you here, and uh, good to see you're still doing well. I was great to see the parking lot, not full, but a lot of cars in the parking lot when we came in for the Sunday school time. And uh, God bless you for that. And by the way, Eva does a great job. And I told her afterward, uh, she, could have, uh, she could have just done what I'm doing. In fact, she set the stage for it. So I'll just remind you what Eva already said. And good to be with Pastor and Teresa again. We love these folks. And uh, so thankful what God is doing to hear the testimonies of what is happening. Well, we've been through this COVID thing. Um, and we, we all lost at least a year somewhere, didn't we? And I think about, you know, what did we do? I, the signs on the freeway said, stay home, save lives. Well, we were for that, so we stayed home for the first year. And uh, then when we got out, guess what? We were like so many of you. We got it. And uh, so we... Uh, we're, we had that experience. We just had all kinds of experiences, not so good. But here we are. Laverne, I want to say, is still uh, protecting me. Uh, she has not taken down any more arsonists in churches. She hasn't done that. She might have taken down something that needed to be taken down. But anyway, so she's, Laverne, you should stand. Let them see that you can still stand. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And we, uh, we're still trying to be active for the Lord. One thing we do is pray for you. And occasionally I'll text pastor and tell him, praying for you this morning. We do that where we have been in uh, 
ministering in other churches, we'll often remind pastors that we're praying for them. And so good to see how God is working in people's lives. Well, Pastor, um, I think it's April 17th is Resurrection Sunday this year. And that may be when we're, the great resurrection happens again. Could be. You know, God kind of does things. He does operate with calendars and uh, time frames. And so I wouldn't be surprised. I know that Easter Resurrection Sunday changes with the calendar year after year, but it could be that this will be the time when there will be another great resurrection. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Most of us say yes, and some of us, I'm not sure. I'm ready for that. Some of you bought, you've ordered a new truck. It hasn't come yet. You ordered a new truck, and they told you it'd be here in April, and now they're telling you it'll be here in, you know, who knows when, as soon as we get computer chips. And if the rapture happens before that truck comes, will you go anyway? Or will you want to wait for your truck? Or that new house that you were going to move into, whatever. Interesting times. So what I, what I titled this message this morning was uh, Consider Your Reach to go along with uh, the theme, Go Share. Uh, we live in these interesting times and some of my beginning remarks about COVID and some of those things are just, not that we, I want to rehearse any of that, but just to remind us that we are living in different Times. It's a different age than any of us in this room have known. I've thought about my grandchildren and thought, you know, am I grieved that they will not know the America that I grew up in? Am I grieved at that? I'm not so sure I'm grieved at that. What I need to do is focus on our future, their future, and help prepare them for a future that I didn't possibly experience. You know, we get into conversations about what's happening in our school systems, our educational systems, and all kinds of systems today. And uh, it becomes increasingly hard for us to find places, grandparents and children to find, our parents find places where our kids are safe from the ideologies that are being forced on them, pressured on them. We were shocked as we were visiting with uh, a grandchild, uh, preteen grandchild recently, and uh, she said to us, well, what's wrong with living together before you're married? That's the kind of ideology that's being pressed on them. That's what they see all the time. Neighbors around them that live that kind of life. What's wrong with it? We need to be ready to give answers. What's wrong, she said, uh, is... Is it bad to have a baby before you're married? That's the kind of world they're growing up in. And so we need to be prepared, and we need to consider our reach. As we begin this morning, would you do this? I thought maybe I'd get some little cards for you, but then you can do this. Somewhere... Uh, I don't know if you have tithing envelopes in there or if we could spare a tithing envelope for this kind of thing, but somewhere, would you get a piece of paper, something that you can kind of take with you, tuck in your Bible perhaps, and would you do this before we begin this morning? Would you write the name of a neighbor, a family member, a friend that you would consider within reach of this church? Someone that you would consider within reach of this church, and you could put more than one, but someone whom you'd like to see accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. It might be a child, grandchild, it might be a mate, neighbor, someone. Would you write that name? Probably a name pops right to your head, and there might be two or three. Yeah, put it in your, put it in your, your cell phone somewhere so you can recall it in the next few days. And then, uh, this is a little more of a test for you. 
Would you choose a number, say, between one and five on how badly do you want to see that person come to Christ? One as top priority. You might have to think about that a little bit. Now, you don't need to share this with anyone. can if you want. But this is our own private little test. I wrote one. And I have a couple of names there, but is it, what is your priority, one to five? How badly do you want to see that person come to Christ? Let me ask you, would that be a goal or is just wishful thinking? I just wish they would come to Christ. Or really, really, I want that person to give their lives to Christ. Now you know that a goal is no good without some kind of a plan or a strategy. How are we going to so if you if you wrote by that name one or two or three, there should be some kind of a strategy. How can we make that happen or can we actually be involved in it? Well, so what would be our strategy? I know. Pastor, would you go visit my Uncle Henry? I think you'd really relate. I mean, you, you, he would like you, and he needs Jesus. Is that maybe going to be our strategy? Or pray. Yeah, we'll pray. How might we pray? Um, uh, Let's pray conviction upon them. That's okay. But the Holy Spirit will convict them. Uh, Let's pray that someone in the supermarket will invite them to church when they're out and about. Uh, Let's ask God to give them a dream of hell and scare them. That's one way to pray, I guess. Well, you folks are getting quiet. Yeah. Or uh, maybe God, let's pray that God will allow something bad to happen in their lives, their influence, uh, cause them to say, oh, I need Jesus. How about some sleepless nights? Um, now, those might work, but those are really not a strategy. <laughs> because... There's nothing I can do about that if I'm except pray and ask God to do it. But Jesus used parables. He used stories to make truths understandable, easy to grasp. And I want us to turn to Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And uh, Elia, will the scripture be up there on the, uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, He's great. Uh, I can send him, and it turned out that it was garbled notes, and I think he got it straightened out. Thank you, Elia. So I want us to read it together, and uh, would you stand with me? It's God's holy word, and let's read this together. If you've got a Bible or a pad or phone of some kind, you can read it there. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Jesus giving us a parable. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by a parable. And again, a parable was to emphasize something that was important. He didn't just tell stories because people wanted to hear a story. He was emphasizing, and the parable was actually to clarify something that they may be confused about. Parables weren't to make things hard to understand. They were to clarify. And so here is this parable. Verse 2. The kingdom of heaven, read it out loud, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. 
And again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed. All things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. Verse 6, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroying those, who murder, those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. You can be seated. The focus of this message this morning, I want to make it on the servants. More is said about the people, the guests who had been invited, but we want to concentrate on the servants for a bit this morning. And first of all, there are several things I want us to note. First of all, the value of the event, the value of the invitation to this event. Pastor, this was not an invitation to go to a Seahawks game. I know that's important to you. It wasn't an invitation to come to a church potluck. This was an invitation to the king's son's wedding. And in context, Jesus is responding to the challenge of chapter 21, 23, and there's it, actually the context follows there, but 23 in chapter 21 says, when Jesus came in the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching, and they said, by what authority are you doing these things? He was casting out the money changers and driving out the animals, and he was challenging the way they were functioning. And they said, who gave you this authority? And Jesus went on to explain. He said, you, you remember, you challenged John the Baptist. By what authority are you out here teaching and preaching? You challenged him, and yet when he told you that you need to repent, you didn't heed him, so I'm not even going to answer your question of me. So the value of the event, uh, this was a king. This was the king, and the king represents Jesus. And uh, this was the king's son. This was going to be the heir possibly to the throne who was getting married. This was a, an event of worth. This was something to pay attention to. Have you ever been invited received an invitation for some important event or to meet somebody important. Laverne and I had an invitation to meet a former president of the United States. We, uh, we were going to be with a group of people in Washington, D.C., and we had an, an invitation to the White House, and it wasn't Donald Trump either. It was Bill Clinton. And I just remember as we received that invitation, some of the conversation with others are going to be in the group among the ladies is, what are you going to wear? Nobody took that invitation and threw it in the trash and said, well, that's a nobody. Didn't matter your political ideology, we're invited to the White House. Preparation begins to take place. Consideration. I don't know that there was anyone in that group that received the invitation that turned it down this was a big deal for us we have a picture somewhere is it still on our wall should be of us with that group in the rose garden and there's president what was his name there was the president standing right there with us That's the power of an invitation from somebody of note. 
And Jesus is emphasizing that the invitation for you to join the kingdom of heaven is not something that you just toss in the trash, not something that you just go about your own business and forget about, but you pay attention to this invitation. The second thing I want us to notice are the messengers of the invitation, those who are bringing the summons. These were king's servants. They were valued and trustworthy representatives of the king. He didn't just say, hey, kid, go tell somebody it's time for dinner. He sent his trustworthy servants out to carry that message. Even if they have, had have had email in that day, that's not the way they would have sent the message. Jesus said that God sent special envoys. John the Baptist was one of those. Jesus said of John the Baptist, there was no one greater. There was the Elijahs, Elijah and Elisha, the Jeremiahs, Isaiahs, all of those. We have their names. We know them about those are people of note in history. These weren't just second-rate individuals that God sent out for the invitation. So, he says to us then, go ye. That suddenly elevates you in this family. Doesn't mean you're better than anybody else, but you're representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords when he says go. First of all, the value of the happening. What is taking place that day? Now, who am I going to send? He sends you and me, and we are in the line of John the Baptist, the prophets and the apostles, to carry this message. Eva said in the class this morning, I, I don't want to be preachy. I don't want to be hard because I'm not a preacher. Eva, preach it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the messengers, we're counted among them. And then the duty of the messengers. This kind of strikes me as interesting. The first time when he sends out the messengers, he says, go call them. Go call them. Tell him it's time. <laughs> he didn't say, go start the barbecue, go kill the fatted calf, go sweep the grounds, go, go. He didn't tell him any of that. He said, your job is just go tell them. They don't even have to pay the bill. Just go tell them. We talk about inviting people to the kingdom of God. We're talking about somebody else that's already paid the price. All we have to do is go tell them. That's really the easiest part of the whole job. And the least costly, the least hurtful, just go tell them. That's all they had to do. And there are major reasons, reasons for the failures in the church. And I don't I don't criticize the church of Jesus Christ and, and criticize its people. I, I, I don't want to get into that. But what I say is sometimes, sometimes the reason churches don't flourish in a community, it's not always, but sometimes. And sometimes the, the reason the name of Jesus is not lifted in a community is because his servants are lazy. I've got other things to do today, things that are more important. I need my beauty rest or whatever it may be. They're lazy sometimes, sometimes selfish. No, I, I don't know. I, I don't want things to change around me. I don't want things to change in my church. I like it the way it is. I'm comfortable. If Pastor Cap finishes up, I'll be out of here in time to get to the restaurant before the crowd. 
Sometimes it's just unbelief. We just don't believe what's being said in the Scripture. We don't believe the importance of this event. And then we notice the urgency of that second call in verse 4. Verse 4, again, he sent out again. He sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are already killed. All things are ready. Come to the wedding. There's an urgency here. This is going to spoil. Something is going to be lost if you don't obey and go. The urgency. The feast is ready. And there's great preparation and expense. Time is of the essence Jesus said to his disciples at the well of Samaria, when they came back surprised that he talked with a woman and that he wasn't interested in the food they had brought from Subway, he was interested in meeting the needs of a lost person. Jesus said, you know, the problem with you guys are this. You say there's four months And then comes the harvest. You notice he didn't say 400 years or 4,000 years. He said four months. You say there's plenty of time. (laughs) Excuse me. And then comes the harvest. He said, fellas, that's your problem. You think it's off down the road somewhere. But I say unto you, open your eyes, disciples. The fields are white Now, Greg, a farmer, the fields are white now for harvest. We can't wait four months when the fields are white. The time is now. And I just, we say, we say to the church, pastor says to the church, let's wake up. How many signs of the soon coming of Jesus Christ do we really need? We've had a pandemic and they say it's coming again. And they can't seem to do anything about it and control it. Does that kind of sound like what Jesus said there would be pestilence in the earth in the last days before he comes? Wars, rumors of war, confusion of nations... Isn't that kind of what Jesus talked about? Immorality. Said wicked men will grow worse and worse, become worse and worse. So now now it's okay for males to compete with girls because that male thinks he's a girl now? What kind of stupid world are we in? Isn't that kind of what Jesus talked about? So, what kind of signs do we need? Israel, its position in the world today. I think that we in this place know that his coming is soon. So he said, listen, the food is ready, the meal is cooked. Can you smell the steaks on the barbecue? Get the guests Here is time for the wedding supper of the Lamb. (coughs) Well, he sent out the folks in response of those that were invited. Verse 3 tells us a response. They were not willing to come. Verse 5, they made light of the event and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. Your invitation will be rejected by some. (laughs) It will. Some of them may mock you. Maybe they would even kill you. That's what they did with these servants. Uh, Luke 14, actually his companion parable, it talks about what they would do. And I better turn to it because I think he probably has it on the screen, doesn't he? Sharper than I am. Look at that. If 
I could find it. I should just read it up there, shouldn't I? Did you find it? Luke 14. So this companion parable, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Probably the only one that had a good excuse is the one that said, I've gotten married, and therefore I can't come. He, he might have. And that, was, that was supposed to be humorous. The only one that had a valid reason. Yeah. So then we see a shift that takes place. Point number six. Back to Matthew 22. A shift takes place, and now it's going to be, instead of inviting friends and acquaintances of the king, it's whosoever, everyone that we can find. In Luke's gospel, he said, that parable said, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. They may be living under a bridge, under a tarp in the neighborhood. <laughs> That's who he said, bring in. And then, so they were obedient in Luke's gospel and said, they came back and said, it's done, and yet there is room. And Jesus said, then go into the highways and hedges and compel them, bring them in. Urge them. Now, that's a little more. See, I said there's a shift. Before, it was just an invitation. Now, it's go and put them in your car. Bring them. You remember when Sunday schools with children were great in our churches? <laughs> now, you talked about my age. Your dad and mom will remember this, and Eva and a bunch of you people remember. Remember when they would have the register on a wall and it would show the Sunday school attendance? And you gauged the success of your church by the attendance and the amount of Bibles that were brought and the size of the offering, Sunday school. Remember that? Anybody remember that besides me? Okay, there you go. Something happened, and it seemed like maybe children being present wasn't quite so important, and especially the fact that we couldn't get people to teach any longer. That was one of the biggest challenges. Now, see, I'm just talking my generation, reminding us of what occurred. So I just want to say to us today that children count, Kids count. They seem to with Jesus. And numbers count. Numbers, that doesn't sound, yeah, numbers are important. We have a whole book in the Bible named Numbers. Numbers are important. People would say, well, numbers are not important in church attendance. Oh, yes, they are. Because that number represents a kid, an elderly person, someone. That number represents a person. They're important. And our churches, especially in the times we're in, need to be concerned about the children, the numbers, and the adults, and the elderly. And don't forget the elderly. We heard the statistic for years in the church. We've heard the statistic that people don't accept the Lord after they get to be elderly. Well, they do. Yes, they do. And they have another reason, because they're thinking, I'm not going to be long in this life. Or I'm lonely. I'm put away in this nursing home somewhere, and nobody can come see me. There are reasons for the elderly to know Christ and receive Christ. Many times they're asking now, what's next? So don't forget, when he said, go out... He said, why? So that my house will be full. They came back and said, it's full. 
okay, it's time for a feast. He wants this house filled with whosoever. That whosoever includes your children, your grandkids, your aunts and your uncles, your neighbors, whosoever. It's important. Years ago, my wife went into a place, I know I told you this when I was here before, but those at my age group you forget and others haven't heard. But we went to, uh, she went to a place of business in Salem to have some alteration done on a garment and the lady was running the place and uh, she started to, uh, how her life was messed up and so on. And, and uh, she had a heavy accent, Laverne, instead of hearing all the story, invited her to church. And she said, where do you go to church? And she said, People's Church in Salem. She said, I want to go with you. And so Laverne, that Sunday, her and I went by. She said, I want to drive my own car so I can learn the way. Invite her to church. Somebody she'd never met before. Somebody that had been, grew, uh, lived in Israel lived in Jerusalem for 25 years and came to the United States. And her kids were, her grown kids were messed up. So we went to church. And I'm telling you this story to remind you how God is interested in having somebody sitting in that pew next to you. And so Ani followed us to church and we went in. And Pastor Scott Erickson introduced a guest speaker that morning. Laverne said she was disappointed because he always gave a salvation message and an invitation. And we have this guest with us that needs Jesus. But Pastor Scott introduced the speaker, happened to be the general superintendent of the country of Jordan. He was there for one service. He was in the United States for one service because... The church had helped them build a Bible school in Jordan, and he had come to thank the church for that effort. And when he introduced salvation, she said, I know him. And the story was, and we're just thinking, yeah, he's from the same neighborhood. She was born in Jordan and grew up in Jordan, and then Israel when she was the adult, and then the United States. So Well, yeah, you're from Jordan also. That's why, you know, the close of the service, she bounced up and she talking to him. And he said, Ani, we were just talking about you the other day. Wondered what had happened to you. Now, is that by divine appointment or what? She had moved from California just some months before come to our town and was working in this business, ends up in a church where this man is going to be. They knew each other. They grew up together. His wife and her mother were friends. We saw Ani receive Jesus as their Savior sometime later and baptized in the Holy Spirit, or baptized in water. Don't know about the Holy Spirit. And she would always say, that's my church. And we were her pastors. Even though we were often doing interims other places, not always in contact with her. And we were down on the south coast a few months ago, an interim, and she had tried to contact, send messages, never heard from Ani, didn't hear from Ani, I wonder what's going on. We got home in November, we went to see her, and a neighbor said she passed away. 50-some years old. Not an old person, not elderly, she passed away. We're saying, church, when God speaks to your heart, you wrote a name down. You wrote a name down, and I believe that God whispered that name in your heart, in your ear. Don't pass up this opportunity. It may sound like a long shot to you, but if God had given Laverne the details of Ani's life, She would have said, nah, maybe. That's too big a long shot. But the fact that Ani ends up in that church the one time when her friend was there. And they 
connected and they communicated back and forth through the years then. That's how God works. That's how I believe he's going to work through some of the people that you have written their names down. And I'm going to finish up. I want to say to you that your pastor is preparing for Easter. You know that. You've been talking about it. He's preparing for Easter. Preparing to spread the table. And believing that there's going to be souls in this place that need Jesus that day. Because it's natural. This is when they respond. They'll come if you'll ask them. And do you know that the majority of people that are saved are saved in a church context? There's something about the power of people coming together and worshiping God and honoring God and listening to the Word of God together that causes them to respond and receive Jesus as their Savior. And I'm believing with you, Pastor, and with you, church, because you're expecting the same thing, that on Resurrection Sunday, there's going to be new souls in this place. Some of those souls are going to be the ones whose names you've written down, and they're going to be here receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And then I don't want to pass up because sometimes we think, well, out of guilt. It's not out of guilt. It's out of love for Jesus and love for the ones that you, whose names you wrote down. But Jesus said there's going to be a reward. Sometimes we forget that. He told the disciples that he who harvests receives wages. Receives wages. He said you will reap what others have sown. Somebody else has done the work. Somebody else has done the labor. But you're going to get a chance to be in the harvest and reap. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? Take out that name. I want to pray with you about that individual. Lay your hand on it wherever you wrote it. And let's believe today that God is going to work in that life. He's going to give you a way. You can't see a way now today, perhaps, but maybe just an email. Sometimes just sending a message will surprise you. I've been involved in that with a neighbor who's we're told their marriage is over, it's done. We haven't been close to them as much as we could have or should have because we've been gone so much. But here was this family member said their marriage is done and I see him post that putting the house on the market, they're going to sell it. And he said, I'm looking for a little place to live and whatever. I text him. I've never done that before to him. I text him and said, so sad to hear this. We're going to be praying for you. Every time we look toward your house, we're praying for you, and God answers our prayers. And he texts back and said, thank you. Gave me a, several communications back. And we've been praying for him, and guess what? It's not all done yet. But what was seemed so impossible is not impossible. They're in a church. They're visiting with counselor. And he texts me and said, God is changing our lives. <laughs> so I'm going to pray with you this morning, and it's not the power of my prayer. It's your prayer, but ours together. Father, you see these names. You laid them on the hearts of these dear folks, Lord. And I believe that they're names of individuals that are critical to the lives of these people. They so desperately want to see them come to you. And Lord, this is not a last-ditch hope. This is the servants being ready to be sent out. And Lord, we're believing that they're going to respond and the house will be full. In Jesus' name, begin to work in the hearts and lives of those individuals. In the name of Jesus, give us creative ways Give us ways, Lord, that we can touch those people and invite them to your house. 
And we're believing that Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, this house will be full. We're believing, Lord, that you're going to prepare the heart of our pastor as he is studying and preparing and wanting to know just exactly what can be said and done in that service to convince those individuals you're preparing his heart and others in this church that are working to spread the table. Lord, we just pray that you will work mightily in Jesus' name, that there be a harvest, Resurrection Sunday in this place. Amen. 